погнать пацана в душу, как в воде Суммы нули погибают на сцене Снова один погуляюсь без стени Заливаю лин пацаной на шее Spoilers for both Isle, the Roblox game, and The Matrix, a movie. In a world where Roblox games seem to choose marketability over creativity 99% of the time, Isle seems to be a perfect balance. Let's talk about it. So, many older Roblox veterans always seem to ask the question, why are there no original games in Roblox anymore? Well, there are plenty of original games on Roblox, they just aren't popular because they aren't marketable. They don't fit the contemporary mold, so nobody ends up playing them or investing in them. And obviously, making something unique takes more effort than just copy-pasting the same game over and over again. You see, Roblox's biggest demographic nowadays is this typical young kid playing on their iPad or parent's phone. So, if a games developer wanted to make a game that was popular, they'd just have to make a game specifically tailored for a young iPad kid to enjoy, and also spend their parent's credit card on. And what genre do kids love for some reason? Horror. So here's a magic formula. Make a shitty horror game where you go around finding objects while a poorly designed AI monster chases them. Make it multiplayer so they can play with their friends. Make it so that if they die they can't respawn unless they pay robux. Make the monster either tall, pitch black, or have glowing eyes. And finally, only make the second chapter of the game if the first one does well. Don't actually release a completed game or anything. Boom. Done. Instant profit. And then when the game dies just make another one that's the exact same in terms of premise. Kids are stupid, and kids won't notice. I mean, they didn't notice how painfully horrible the game was the first time around. So, yeah, you can make a game that's unique. But games like that are complicated most of the time, and complicated means that kids aren't going to understand it. So, only like 40 or so teenagers will be playing your game daily. Games that are quality are not profitable 90% of the time in Roblox. So, why would you bother putting so much effort into a game? that only 50 or so people will play when you can just half-ass it and get hundreds and thousands of players every day. With this testament in mind, Roblox players have jumped to this conclusion that a game is either A, popular and stale, or B, unique and dead in the dirt. If only a certain Roblox story game could reach a near-perfect balance between accessibility and quality. Oh wait, it's Isle. There's lots of stuff to cover regarding this game, so it kind of made structuring the video difficult to some extent, but I guess we'll just try to start at the beginning. Isle can be classified as a story game on Roblox, and it's about you, yourself, trying to escape an Isle before time runs out. On surface level, this game fits all the story beats needed to make an accessible story game. You have multiplayer lobbies, an easy to understand premise, a game that can run on mobile, no respawning for added replayability, and, of course, the monster is a black silhouette with glowing red eyes. But there's more. I mean, this simplicity and straightforwardness is enough to catch the eye and attention of young mobile players, but as I played the game, I kept thinking to myself, there's totally more to this game. It, yeah, there is. There's layers to this game. And not just layers of random shit, I mean layers that blend together well to form a larger picture. These people who made this game had a plan from the start on what they wanted the game to be. They didn't just make a shitty game and smear some more shitty updates on top of that. Alright, so if you're not familiar with Isle, play it, but here's a plot summary anyways. So, you start out the game as this prisoner on a boat, traveling to some unknown location, and then there's this monstrous roar, and the boat gets attacked, and there's an explosion that causes everybody to black out and wake up following the crash. Now, your main objective is to escape the titular Isle, but a lot of people who play Isle have already done just that, so why do they keep playing? Well, you know what they say, the journey is better than the destination. So, you have five days to escape the Isle, and you're given a couple of options on how you're gonna do it. For starters, there's four endings, but the method on how you're going to get those endings is up to you completely. There's a noticeably large surplus of guns on the island despite nobody being on it, so you can just go around murdering people to steal their stuff. Or murder people for fun, even if they don't have anything on them. The latter is always a more popular choice. Most first-time players are either going to A, die by the monster, B, escape with the plane, or C, get shot seven times in the back. Each day that you spend on the Isle is a progression in danger. There's a tropical storm approaching, and it makes the visibility drastically worse. The monster gets stronger, and a group of mercenaries show up to put you down following your initial escape from the boat. The Isle holds many secrets, as well as many dangers, and all of these assets don't feel like they're tacked on or shoehorned in at all, as they all serve some sort of purpose in the game's lore or mechanics. <laughs> the central antagonist is this typical Roblox horror story monster thing. Although people like to call him Stan because of the guy from Identity Fraud of the same name. The monster is established super early as a threat as it's seen stalking your player before disappearing when you turn oh. to look oh at it. Oh my god, stop bro, I'm stuck! What the hell are you doing? <laughs> the monster becomes stronger and more active in the dark. It won't attack you during broad daylight, but it will attack you in your sleep when the sun goes down. 
As the tropical storm approaches, the sunlight becomes gradually more and more blocked out, and the monster will begin to attack you during the daytime in days 4 and 5. On day 6, the final day, a message is shown saying that the tropical storm has completely blocked off the island, as well as any means of escape. And the last thing that you hear is the sound of the monster speeding towards you before you die. A big strength of Isle is that the game knows how and when to utilize its monsters in order to advance the game. A lot of games just have monsters for the sake of having monsters, but Isle makes sure each and every one serves its purpose. In Stan's case, he's meant to be this reminder from the very start that there is very much an active growing threat on the Isle, constantly giving you a reason on why you need to escape this place. The monster is also fairly easy to deal with. Yes, it can wake you up in the middle of the night and it can kill you, but the simple solution to this problem is just falling asleep either inside or not on the ground. You can also bring a gun and just get the shit out of him. When he starts attacking players during the day, he will insta-kill them via snapping their necks, but also instantly halts his attack and disappears if you look at him. Having this pervasive threat that constantly has you looking over your shoulder was a nice touch, and I like how the monster and the tropical storm go hand in hand in creating progressive difficulty for the player. The mercenaries are very much what most players will die to, other than other players. Day 2 is called The Hunt, and when most players are greeted with this message, that sounds threatening. And then you hear this helicopter, and the guy with the heat vision goggles in your party sees a bunch of people just spawning, and they're like, oh shit, there's people coming to kill us. The mercenaries are very much not a traditional monster, but they still have this scary quality to them. The thought that you're being actively hunted by people that can't be reasoned with is not the best thought on your mind to say the least. They wander around the map constantly checking for you, and each member specializes in its own unique skill set. There's a commander, a medic, a sniper, a spotter, and a gunner. The mercenaries can be evaded easily if you're aware of their location, and they walk at normal player speed. However, the sniper is the deadly one here. The scoped rifle in this game deals 100 or so damage, meaning it's a one-shot kill unless a player has a ballistic vest, which are rare. Each mark has a spotting range of 300 odd studs, which is enhanced by the spotter himself, who has a range of about 1200 studs. So if the spotter spots you, he'll alert the sniper, and the sniper, having his giant range, will shoot you in the chest and you'll die. The mercenaries are quite scary for players who are still trying to get a hang of the game, but give it a few tries and you'll soon learn how to deal with them. My favorite way of dealing with them is the scoped rifle and the ammo crate, but there's a lot of methods. The mercenaries are a very real threat, they're way more present than the monster, and they keep you constantly on alert. However, they also serve as a progressive turning point for many players, as once a player learns how to deal with the mercenaries, they seem to have gotten a proper hang of the game, and they aren't really that scared anymore. In fact, it even gets to the point where killing the mercenaries becomes the highlight of every playthrough. Killing them will also reward you with a level 3 keycard, which is useful in not only escaping, but dealing with the next wave of mercenaries, as there's a lot of crates around the island that need a level 3 keycard. And I fucking hate hacking. After killing all the mercenaries, we'll be greeted with this message on screen saying that tomorrow will be dreadful, or something like that. And the next day the elite mercenaries show up. They're similar in the way that every member is different except they have scarier weapons. Also, the elite mercenaries will always be aware of your location and constantly be on your tail. They're more challenging to deal with, definitely, but like, for my POV, I just did the same thing I did the first time and it worked. If you kill them, you get a level 4 keycard, which is nice and all, but you won't need guns anymore unless you plan on killing players, as there won't be any more mercs after this, and also none of the monsters can be killed with guns. Yes, you can shoot them, but you can't kill them. Life would be the robot is based off of Mr. X from Resident Evil 2, I assume, and he isn't explained much at all, but he doesn't really need much explanation at all either. When activating an artifact on the aisle, artifacts are like these little things that you can activate and they give you powerful buffs, you get this message that says something else is drawing near your artifact. Periodically, Mr. X will We'll teleport to a person with an artifact, or anybody really, and will constantly follow them until they can't find them anymore. Mr. X moves at the default walk speed so you can outsmart him, no but he still poses as a negative consequence in exchange for the artifact's power. His attacks are relatively easy to get around unless you're actively trying to get him to step on your balls, but please note that not every time he teleports to you will be the most convenient of times. I don't want claymores, I want grenades. Can you carry a medkit for me at least? Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> The snake reminds me heavily of the Basilisk from Harry Potter, and I didn't even realize it until just now. It roams around Monkey Land, which is the unofficial name for wherever Artifact B is located. Once again, the snake is easy to avoid so long as you know what you're doing, but this doesn't mean that the threat isn't there. If it sees you, it'll go straight for you, and the gem in its head will paralyze you unless you're wearing goggles. Pretty scary stuff. Once again, this shit isn't explained, but I don't think it needs to be, considering it's just kind of there to guard the artifact. Also, I'm pretty sure the scientists were studying it, but then it broke free. 
The Sea Monster is the most disappointing in my opinion when it compared to the other monsters, but at least it's more interesting than a drowning mechanic. I am under the water. Please help me. It kills players who wander too far out at sea, and it causes the boat crash at the start of the game. Also, it attacks a boat if you try to escape without distracting it. The things that the sea monster does can be easily be explained with normal, boring stuff, like an unexplained fire at the start of the game, or something on the boat that causes the crew to lose control, or just being stuck stranded in the middle of the ocean because you didn't bring the right part when you tried to escape with the boat. Eh, it doesn't matter. It's a cool concept that they tried to make things interesting rather than mundane, although I wish the sea monster was shown in-game. Yes, not seeing the sea monster is scary and all, but it just really isn't there at, as much as the other monsters are, nor is it very unique at all. To the end. In this game, you can kill other players. If you kill too many players, your eyes will turn red for everybody to see. Players who have this corrupted effect will be greeted by not the monster when they fall asleep, but this generic white guy instead. I'm assuming that it's just kind of there to be a detriment for players who try to kill others constantly, but getting killed by this guy gives you a cool badge and a title, so it kind of has the opposite effect really, because I see people trying to get this badge all the damn time. Io manages to have all these monsters who all serve their own purpose without overcomplicating things. The chances that you're running to two at the same time is very unlikely, and they're all just kind of like their own little isolated incidents. The game manages to avoid the complications of trying to make the monster story compelling, or trying to rationalize why they exist on the island, as their whole mysteriousness is what adds to their character in a way, and contributes to this horror-type atmosphere. The mercenaries could totally be these nice guys on the inside, but they display absolutely no remorse or emotion in what they do, showing that humans can be just as scary as monsters. Even monsters that are not initially scary, like Mr. X, who shows up during the daytime constantly, still manages to influence the player's thought process with the constant need to adjust their plans whenever he shows up. I can't count the amount of times where I've been trying to kill the mercenaries and this guy just walks in without giving a fuck and just overcomplicates everything. Yo! Most players aren't going to be able to explore the entire island in their first playthrough to say the least. I mean, it's huge. The isle holds many secrets and it's really interesting learning about all of them as you progress further and further with every playthrough. The plane escape is easy and doesn't require much thought, it's just repairing a plane with specific parts. But the boat ending and the lab escape require a little bit of premeditated, pre emotive, pre premediative, pre existing knowledge of the isle. While working to escape through the portal or the boat, you're going to find yourself going through the lab and stuff, realizing that this isle once had a whole research lab dedicated to researching artifacts and specimen. Then there was a storm incoming, so everybody just up and left, and all the specimen broke out. Also, something I noticed was that the key cards work on both the boat's armory and the laboratory crates and doors, which kind of heavily implies that the prison and the scientists who built the lab were related somehow. When I first got to the lab, I thought this game's big twist was going to be everything that was supernatural can be explained by a scientific corporation illustrating the entire thing. Okay, I mean, yeah, you could say that, but I will get to that in a second. Anyways, the lab and all that is not the bottom of the iceberg, but it's not the tip either. More so, the shaft of the story that, that serves to explain more plot points that will eventually get to the bottom of all this. You feel? The true ending is hot, I guess. Is it completely original? No, but that doesn't mean it's discreditable. If you've ever seen the ending to The Matrix, then the true ending to Isle is just that. After dying or escaping during your Isle playthrough, your, play your character is returned to the lobby and you get this little hindsight where a character reflects on what just happened to them. Like, for example, if you get gatted by somebody, your character will be like, hmm, maybe I shouldn't have pulled up on a guy with a 9. But what's interesting is that these lines aren't just for the sake of getting players advice on what not to do. They serve an actual purpose in the game's lore. If you escape, your character will wonder why they're back in the lobby when they escape the island. And eventually, you start getting little inputs from a mysterious being that tells you stuff like, Man, this isle sucks to watch. Bring four artifacts to me, and I shall help you. So after doing just that, you're teleported to some sort of weird abstract computer place, and you're greeted by this guy named Ivory Mind, who tells you to stop trying to escape, and he tries to terminate you. But then Ivory Lotus, the one that was talking to you earlier, bursts through the wall to save you. Ivory Mind says, humankind is long gone, we are keeping the humans inside of the isle because if they leave then they'll just all die out or kill each other. I mean seriously bro, people thought this game was a battle royale game for a hot minute. But then Ivory Lotus says, well yeah, but then there's a bunch of humans who actually try to cooperate and help each other out and share items and use teamwork, you know. After all, you can only carry three items at once without a drone, so you ought to work together. Also, your program is outdated. So, then there's this little battle between the two, you fight a bunch of AIs, then you, you leave through the teleporter, and you wake up. And yeah, it's the Matrix. 
You make your way through this abandoned facility, you see this little reference to the island, and then you also realize that Ivory Lotus and Ivory Mine aren't really that powerful outside of the Isle simulation. They're like, they're not GLaDOS, they're just here. They're just passively here, running on like Windows 9 or something, I don't know. Ivory Mind is literally just a cyberbully. Anyhow, you eventually make your way to the door to leave. It's snowy outside, and there's an end screen that says you came across a log cabin that looks like it's been used before, implying that there's other people like you out there in the world. And you go to sleep without waking up in the prison again. Man, what an ending. It's kind of copying the Matrix, but not really. You see, especially when we talk about Roblox, nothing is 100% original nowadays. In the whole, it was all a dream trope is certainly nothing new in media. The game was inspired by the Matrix, I'd like to think, but the ending and the premise and the setup for this ending on Isle is different enough to set itself apart. For one, the ending is used appropriately. It effectively coins everything as just a simulation without discrediting it, as everything you went through on the Isle did in fact happen and has somewhat significance in the real world. It is unclear where the people who programmed the Isle got the inspiration for it, but this might cross over into the danger zone of over-explaining things, so it might be for the best. Maybe if they make a sequel, it'll have references that sort of point at it, I don't know. Finally, the original point of the video. You see, Isle has kept a consistent fan base after all this time due to the fact that it's so different from other games on Roblox. It is a story game, but it's not exclusively for small children. However, at the same time, it's easy enough for them to access and understand and become invested in enough in this game to learn more about it. The game isn't this crazy FPS where 15 to 21 year old PC players are at an advantage and stomping the shit out of little kids. Isle is very much a puzzle story adventure-esque game where your wits will get you far. The gun system is not one of an SPS game. It's one where you just click on your target and shoot, which heavily levels the playing field for mobile players. Also, I lost my shit when this message appears on my screen. The game is able to cater to both mature and young players, and the story is interesting yet mysterious to keep you thinking. I definitely think that they could make a sequel to Isle, perhaps an indirect sequel, but definitely not an Isle 2 Electric Boogaloo. A game that is so competent and consistent throughout is a little hard to replicate a second time around. I'd imagine. I believe that what made me think for a while about Isle was how the game's progression was able to sync so well with the player's own progression. Like I said, the game starts out as a simple monster tale, and then the mercs show up, you're scared as shit, but after a few times the mercs aren't so scary anymore and the huge island doesn't seem so huge anymore. Throughout your time playing Isle, you're continually evolving and adapting, becoming more and more familiar with the game to the point where it isn't really a scary game at all anymore. The Matrix-esque ending is used appropriately in this context, as stated before, as the quest to get it is the final showcase of all your cumulative game knowledge, showing that you basically conquered the entire isle. And now, after escaping your confinement and waking up, you've ascended. You see the isle is nothing more than just a simulation within a computer, and all of your enemies were just as insignificant in comparison. This can also be seen as a double-edged sword, however, as everything you understood about the game's universe was basically a lie. Ivory Mine and Ivory Lotus do exist in the real world, but you've left them in the dust. They're nothing in the end, really. Waking up in the real world flips the entire game on its head. It shows that what you were once used to is now thrown completely out the window. Once you finally understand everything, you're left guessing again. I really don't think anything else would have been as satisfying or effective. Okay, so I was really good and really addicting. I hope that you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please consider the good old like, subscribe, also hit notifications so you don't miss another video, and yeah, yeah, you get it all. Join my Discord, talk to me, haha. Another Roblox game review, guys. And it wasn't about zombies or centered around nostalgia. Who would have thought? If I'm being honest here, my mic is really bad lately, so I was considering getting somebody to actually record this for me, or to narrate this for me. You you know how that went. Yeah, once again, join my Discord, blah blah blah, let's talk, let's chat, I, I'll host game nights, I promise, I'll try to, I don't fucking know. Anyways, thank you so much for liking and sharing and supporting me for so long, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.